You're watching a video on advancing energy democracy from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. This video complements the NAACP Just Energy Toolkit segment on community-owned clean energy. It begins with an interview at the site of a community solar project in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm standing here on the roof of Shiloh Temple in North Minneapolis, surrounded by solar panels. We're just about two miles from downtown. It's a beautiful sunny spring day, and the solar panels on this roof here are enough to power about 50 to 60 energy efficient homes. It's a different kind of solar array than we normally have in the sense that it doesn't just serve the building below, but it also serves over 20 households who have subscribed as members of this community solar array. I'm John Farrell. I'm the director of the Energy Democracy Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. With me is Timothy Denherter thomas He's the general manager of Cooperative Energy Futures, which is the developer of this project. We interviewed him over two years ago for our Local Energy Rules podcast when this project was just getting started. I'd like you to just describe for a little bit how this project differs from most community solar projects in terms of its size, its location, but also the level of ownership of its participants. Sure. Uh, so about 90% of community solar here in Minnesota is serving commercial and industrial customers, so it's not serving residents at all. Uh, of the remaining 10% that is serving residential customers, uh, basically all of the other developers that are out there are using a minimum credit score, usually either 680 or 700, uh, as the minimum for who can participate. Uh, that essentially means that uh, most low-income families, uh, as well as statistically uh, most people of color, uh, are excluded from participating in community solar. This community solar garden, as well as the other community solar gardens that uh, we develop as Cooperative Energy Futures, um, are different because we don't use a minimum credit score. Um, that means that everyone can actually participate. We're really developing community solar uh, here at Shiloh Temple and the other gardens that we develop uh, as a way to create a, a clean energy asset here in the community uh, that's benefiting the people that use it. Timothy, I know one other thing that you've done with this project that's relatively unique is around training and hiring, so that you had a commitment when we talked previously to train and hire folks in the local community to do this installation. Can you tell me a little bit about, more about why that was important to you in developing this project and then how that turned out? Yeah, um, we've seen a, a really big expansion of the solar industry, but um, so far most of those jobs um, have not been benefiting people of color and low-income people. Uh, we see a lot of racial disparities in the workforce around solar, and that's a huge piece of what we want to address uh, as we develop these, these community solar gardens with a justice lens. Uh, and so we required our insulation contractor to use at least 50% minority labor. Um, and actually, the installer that we've used, Innovative Power Systems, has, has used a crew that's actually closer to 90% minority labor, uh, including a number of folks from here in North Minneapolis. Uh, we have also partnered uh, with a training program to help uh, build people's skills in the solar industry so that more people are qualified for those jobs as we create demand for the hiring. So, Timothy, I imagine... You can look around this uh, installation up here with a little bit of pride since it's been a long time in development. I hear that the switch might get flipped next, as early as next week and the power uh, from these solar panels will start flowing both to the temple beneath us as well as to the different customers. What else does Cooperative Energy Futures have in the pipeline? Sure. So um, this is our first project and it has been about three years uh, of work to get here. So we are very, very glad to be at the, at the point of operation. Um, but this is uh, really just kind of the, the first step in a series of eight projects um, that we have coming. Uh, the second uh, will be starting construction very soon um, on the Edina Public Works building in Edina. Uh, we also have another installation at a church uh, down in Eden Prairie. Um, four ground mounts in greater Minnesota, including up by St. Cloud and three in southern Minnesota. Uh, and then our final project, um, which is a very exciting project, is just about two miles from here, um, which is uh, canopy over ramp A in uh, downtown Minneapolis. And altogether, that's about 6.7 megawatts of solar. So this project is 200 kilowatts. Uh, that's roughly 35 times that amount. Uh, and we'll be providing power uh, for about 700 households across the state. I have to say on a personal note, I'm very excited about the Ramp A project as a potential subscriber, but also just for its visibility in the sense that it's uh, the parking ramp right next to the Twin Stadium. So I'm hoping that it will also be a way to help feature solar for folks who might not have been aware of it. Cooperative Energy Futures is the only cooperatively owned community solar developer in Minnesota, the nation's leading community solar market. The Shiloh Temple Community Solar Project went live in May 2018 and the Ramp A project will be under construction later in 2018. Both projects provide powerful reminders of how the right policy enables energy customers to choose how they spend their energy dollars.
Unfortunately, developing good community renewable energy projects isn't always easy. Minnesota is just one of 16 states with policies enabling the sharing of electricity. Most policies, like Minnesota's, are specific to solar. Community wind projects, for example, aren't usually covered. At ILSR.org, there are recommendations about well-designed state community renewable energy policies. In states without explicit policies to support community renewable energy, the work to capture this local energy is harder, but no less rewarding. In an interview with ILSR's Local Energy Rules podcast, Peter Hansel described the outcome of a community solar project installed on the Monadnock Food Co-op in Keene, New Hampshire. The essence of local business, local investment, really paid off because we have a local host, local investors, local installer. It, it really worked out perfectly for, from that point of view. The outcome was never certain. Advocates had to grapple with rigid New Hampshire net metering and investment rules. It meant they couldn't follow the typical community solar model. In states that do have community solar policies, projects can be owned by entities other than the utility company. These project owners can recruit subscribers, sometimes hundreds of them, to sign agreements to purchase electricity from the solar arrays. The Monadnock project, on the other hand, had fewer than a dozen investors and just a single energy consumer, the co-op. The investors had to set up their own limited liability corporation, which came up with $90,000 in local investment. The food cooperative put up the rest of the capital, arranged as a prepayment for electricity from the solar array. The co-op also has a power purchase agreement with the community investors at a very discounted rate. All told, the cooperative should pay less for electricity in the long run. The arrangement works out, but only because the individuals who put money in are able to take the federal solar tax credit. This chart, taken from a late 2016 blog post at ILSR.org called Further Thoughts on the Economics of Losing the Federal Solar Tax Credit, shows how failing to capture the tax credit raises the cost of a project by a penny per kilowatt hour. It also shows that if local investors can use the tax credit, they can produce cheaper power than by partnering with Wall Street investors. In some states, willing utilities, particularly rural electric cooperatives and municipal city-owned utilities, have made community solar possible without state laws. This map shows how cooperative and public power utilities have been offering community solar programs across the country. Just having a program isn't always enough, however. It's important to know whether the community solar investment is a good deal. This chart, taken from ILSR's 2016 report on community renewable energy called Beyond Sharing, compares the benefits of participating in community solar, in the orange bars, to the financial return of having a home rooftop solar array in the blue. While not everyone has this option, it's a key comparison for understanding if community solar is a good deal. For example, in Colorado, a customer participating in Clean Energy Collective's community solar project will see far more financial return than if they simply put solar on their own rooftop. In Arizona, however, the story is reversed. Participants in community solar with Tucson Electric Power will have far less financial benefit than if they simply put solar on their own rooftop. Community renewable energy projects are an essential tool for allowing broader participation in the clean energy economy, but they're not the only thing. We're going to discuss three key approaches toward a clean, local, equitable, affordable, and reliable energy economy. To do so, we'll use ILSR's new Community Power Toolkit. It provides examples sorted into three categories, powering up my neighborhood, my utility, and my city. ILSR's Community Power Toolkit is an interactive way to browse the policies and practices communities have successfully adopted to advance energy democracy. It shows examples of policies, success stories, and illustrations of impact. We'll start with a tour of how we can power up at the neighborhood level by discussing solar buying cooperatives. These come in many flavors, including city-led campaigns, but we'll talk specifically about Solar United Neighbors, a network of buying cooperatives that started with the Mount Pleasant Solar Cooperative in Washington, D.C. To tell the story, here's a clip from our 2013 podcast with Anya Schoolman, whose sons helped launch this local solar effort. So um, the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op is really a group of neighbors that got together because they wanted solar. And what we do is um, help each other uh, get through the barriers to going solar, whether the barriers are 
uh, not having enough information or dealing with installers or um, dealing with our local government. And we share information, we have meetings in people's houses, and then we do a lot of deployment of solar on the residential. That's how we started. And we actually have installed solar on 10% of the houses in our neighborhood, uh, which is more than 100 houses. And um, we're, you know, just getting started. The solar cooperatives of Solar United Neighbors have had a big impact for members and others. Over 10,000 households are part of 80 solar co-ops across 10 states. The co-ops have collectively installed nearly 20 megawatts of solar, often at a significant discount to going it alone. And co-op members are helping everyone by defending solar rights through advocacy in West Virginia, Ohio, Florida, and Washington, D.C. The focus on solar rights has been essential even from the beginning. Listen to Anya describe how a failure by the district to enforce its renewable portfolio standard had to be remedied and how the fix made solar purchases for co-op members finally work. Even though we had a renewable portfolio standard uh, requiring solar to go on the grid, that renewable portfolio standard wasn't being implemented. In fact, our utility was paying the fine rather than playing in a market. And so that the incentive that should have been provided by that renewable portfolio standard to go solar wasn't available. And so instead of doing a bulk purchase, we shifted our focus to policy and we passed a law that doubled the fine on the utility, which then created an incentive um, through our solar renewable energy credit to go solar, which made all the difference in the world. It's not just in Washington, D.C. where policy matters. Anya suggests that neighborhood-level organizing and project work can't be divorced from policy work. The two have to go together. To me, it's sort of one of the big lessons for me and, and really what guides my whole approach to this issue is that project development, if you're, you're coming at it from sort of an advocacy perspective, needs, you need to do the policy. That anybody who thinks they can just stay in the projects and never get into the policy, they're really naive. And inversely, I think it's equally unhealthy to do policy without the projects because then what you find is that people are passing these, you know, big targets, you know, renewable portfolio standard or whatever without any real understanding of how it impacts the market or whether it actually is being operationalized. And so what we really advocate is this connect, uh, like a cycle where we do projects as a mechanism to do organizing, which leads to policy reform, which leads to more projects, which leads to more organizing, which leads to more policy reform. And that's exactly the cycle that we've been going through. We'll talk more about the virtuous cycle between project development and policy work when we discuss cities in a few minutes. In the meantime, let's talk about shifting how utilities support local energy. The first thing to understand is that there are three kinds of electric companies. Investor-owned companies are owned by shareholders and tend to serve only urban areas. Municipal utilities tend to serve central or small rural cities. Rural electric cooperatives, as you might guess from their name, tend to cover most of rural America. We can see an illustration of this within North Carolina. This map shows the urban areas and urban centers from the 2010 U.S. Census. When we overlay it on a map of utility service areas, we can see that the purple urban areas are almost universally served by investor-owned utilities, represented by striped areas. Rural electric cooperatives, shown in green in the underlying map, primarily serve rural areas. Municipal utilities serve a select few dozen cities. Let's learn what some of the various utilities have done to promote energy democracy, starting with Farmer's Electric Cooperative and its promotion of local solar in Iowa. Our vision was to um, not only reduce power bills, but to um, keep the, the money in the community. So solar has allowed us to buy local. Yeah, that's from local producers, basically. Our model's based around that. So I, I think, you know, some of the rationale was, um, one, we make it easy to do. And um, like the electric car, I think people see it as, uh, the future basically in technology and um, yeah it's if you make it easy I think they're gonna grab a hold of it yeah 
It's been very, very popular with our customers. Yeah, you know, you, you set a vision early on and then and then you're seeing it happen, you know, it's flourishing. There are skeptical people in all this and then when the skeptics come in and put solar in, that's when you that's when you have that aha moment, right? So it's yeah, making it work and uh, turning people um, that it can work. Next, let's talk about inclusive energy financing, a way that utilities can share their expertise and their resources to help customers reduce energy use and costs without requiring them to provide money up front. What if your home could be fixed up so that you're cool in the middle of summer and nice and warm in the dead of winter and you have more money every year for things you need? Your electric utility can make it possible. Here's how. First, they send a certified contractor to your home to see what energy efficiency improvements can be made to lower your electric bill. Then, your utility pays for improvements like replacing old energy guzzling equipment and sealing up your home or apartment against the heat and cold. You end up with a more comfy and healthy home and your electric bill goes down because you're not using as much energy. The utility recovers its cost for the upgrades through a charge on your bill, but the charge is less than the savings, so your bill is still lower. There are no loans, no credit checks, and no debt, and everyone can participate, even if you rent instead of own your place. If you move, the charges and the savings simply apply to the next folks moving in. Easy, right? It's called Pay As You Save. It's an on-bill financing model, and it's catching on with electric cooperatives leading the way. Call your electric utility today to ask if they provide home energy efficiency improvements financed on your electric bill. And if they don't, let them know it's time to start. Electric utilities can also promote community solar gardens, as we talked about earlier, or help create the infrastructure for electric vehicles, which helps customers reduce their costs of fueling up. Fuel savings from switching to electric cars are well over $1,000 per year in every state, and electric vehicles eliminate local pollution from cars. You can read more about this in our 2017 report, Choosing the Electric Avenue. Utilities can help promote electric vehicles in several ways including by using inclusive energy finance to help transit agencies buy electric buses, spreading the benefits to everyone. They can provide affordable public chargers for those without off-street parking, as done by Austin Energy in Texas. And utilities can also provide cheap charging when there's low demand, as these utilities have done, through offering very low-cost charging during nighttime hours. Getting utilities to do the right thing isn't always easy, but advocates can apply pressure in several ways. Direct action can sometimes embarrass or motivate a utility to change behavior. With public utilities or cooperatives, it's possible to lobby the city council or the board of directors that oversees the utility, or for a customer to even run for that office. For shareholder-owned utilities, those big ones that typically serve large cities, state regulators, usually called public utilities or public service commissions, will take comments from the public on energy policy decisions. Finally, let's look at the wealth of options for building local power through your city government. Although there's plenty to pick from, we'll talk about two options, one that's a relatively small lift and one that's bigger. The first one is getting solar installed on public buildings, a way to share the economic benefits of going solar with everyone. Every dollar saved on a city electric bill is a dollar that can be spent on libraries or workforce opportunities. In a report a couple of years ago, called Public Rooftop Revolution, ILSR found that in the 200 largest U.S. cities, there was an opportunity to install solar power enough to power 1 million homes using just the rooftops of public buildings. For that report, we interviewed city officials from several cities about their efforts. Here's a clip from our conversation with Charles Harris from Kansas City, where the 1.5 megawatts of solar leased from a private developer are saving the city about $15,000 per year. 
I feel like Kansas City is in, in some ways a story for a lot of Midwestern towns that might be looking at solar in terms of solar overcoming adversity. You don't have the greatest solar resource in the country and you have cheap electricity from the grid. So I'm curious, you know, was it an environmental motivation that got the city looking at sol doing solar energy? Part of it was back in 2006, we established this um, KCML climate protection plan. What we wanted to do was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from municipal buildings. And part of that solution was to obtain about 15% of our energy from renewable sources. Now, the key to the success with solar seems to be this pretty novel leasing arrangement that you had with, I think it was the company Brightergy, but also the incumbent utility, Kansas City Power & Light. Can you explain about how did that leasing arrangement make solar affordable and also why the project was split between those two different vendors? Well, it made it affordable because uh, as a municipality, we really don't have a lot of money. A lot of our, our resources go to things that we already have in place to take care of. So in order to get that 15% renewable, we had to have another vehicle to do that. And our local utility case, p &L, came out with this rebate for renewable energy that made it very attractive. And what we did was we entered into two separate 20-year lease agreements with both of these companies whereby they bought the material, that is the solar material, installed it on our buildings, and they're guaranteeing us a certain amount of energy production. Now, we didn't have to pay for that upfront cost for the material, so what we're doing is we are leasing the material for these 20 years, and we lease it. Their lease agreement is based upon the amount of energy that those systems produce. So it offsets our existing utility bill. The the rebate that you mentioned from Kansas City Power and Light, do you remember what value that rebate had and, and how that made the solar more affordable? Basically, it was $50,000 per system. So both KCPNL and Brightergy were able to pay for the equipment and the installation with that rebate. We also talked with folks from Lancaster, California. Here's a clip from our Local Energy Rules podcast interview with Jason Caudill, the city manager, about their efforts to promote local solar. Well, our first project we did was with Solar City, and it was a behind the meter, you know, very standard PPA. If you will buy the energy from you and you own the facility. We then, as we went through that process, realized it really wasn't that complicated and really wasn't that difficult. It was more a story of financing than it was a story of engineering or construction. You know, the system itself is pretty simple. I'm not an electrician, but <laughs> I, mean, you know, I think as we saw it be built, so, you know, this isn't that difficult. This difficult this strategy was financing it so that you could maximize the lower cost. And what we were able to do was take tax exempt municipal financing, procure the energy on behalf of the schools, and then sell it back to the schools. So the schools weren't in the business of building things or generating electricity, the city could be and the city was interested. So we kind of stepped in there and said, no, let us, we understand this a little better than you do. We know how to do this. Let us take that risk. Let us move that ball forward for you. And we did, and it was successful at the end of the day. Cities don't have to stop with their own property. They can also use their power to take over the utility company. In seven states, they can do this with a policy called community choice aggregation. In this case, the incumbent utility stays in the picture as the deliverer of electricity between the suppliers the city picks and the customers. In this interview with Don Weiss of Marin Clean Energy, you can hear more about the efforts to create a local energy supply company. Now, by all accounts, you had a long, hard road to set up Marin Clean Energy. What makes it worth the effort? Well, it was absolutely worth the effort because we've been able to achieve many of the goals that we set out and actually even exceed many of the, the goals that we set out as far as um, getting more renewable energy onto the grid and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we've been able to do that by purchasing more than double the amount of renewable energy that customers were getting before and uh, offering rates that are competitive and in most cases lower for customers than what they would have been paying with the incumbent utility. You know, speaking of your success, many incumbent utilities like PG&E say that it will be costly or technically challenging or prohibitive or both to offer a high percentage of renewable energy to their customers. How can Marin Clean Energy offer, you know, as I read, a minimum of 50% renewable energy and then an option for 100% renewable for just a penny more per kilowatt hour. 
Well, we're able to offer competitively priced renewable energy because we have a low operating costs. We are a small and nimble shop uh, here in the community. We procure in a very prudent way. We, we are careful about not overspending, but maximizing renewables within our portfolio. Another key factor is that we don't have shareholder profit to account for. Any revenue that comes into the agency um, is used to keep rates low uh, or to, to help fund other local programs that benefit the community, like solar rebate programs for low-income individuals, energy efficiency programs, electric vehicle charging, that sort of thing. While most states do not provide the option of community choice aggregation, cities do retain the authority to take over the utility completely. Municipalization, as it's called, involves making decisions about where to buy the power and delivering the power by buying the existing utilities' poles and wires, and sometimes even power plants. In this interview with Susan Osborne, the mayor of Boulder, Colorado, she describes how the city's long efforts to increase local renewable energy finally resulted in the city looking to take over the utility company. We're looking at the first um, opportunity for council to make a go, no go decision in April. And the memo that was released on Friday for the study session tonight looks, it does a lot of modeling of different possible options for a utility of the future. And there's a baseline, but it also includes the possibility of working with Excel. We've included in the memo, I think, is a fairly obvious challenge to Excel. We've asked them to give us some proposals of how we might work with them in a different sort of way in the future. And we haven't gotten anything back from them, and we're hoping we will. I, uh, I have to quote from the, the Boulder Daily Camera story that I found. They highlighted five key points from the report, and I think they're worth mentioning in, in the context of where Boulder is trying to go, that one, it could offer lower rates over a 20-year time frame. Yeah. Uh, a municipal utility could maintain or exceed current levels of reliability, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50% from current levels, and exceed the Kyoto goals within the first year, get 54% or more of its power from renewable resources, and essentially create a model public utility that it would allow for innovation in everything from energy efficiency to customer service. Boulder's effort to form a city-owned utility has stretched seven years since it first passed the ballot in November 2011. In that time, its utility has made several moves to increase renewable energy development and close aging fossil fuel power plants, but has yet to live up to the energy democracy goals of Boulder to produce more local energy for its own economic benefit. Thank you for watching this three-part video module on advancing energy democracy from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. It highlighted the power of a successful community renewable energy project the challenges in replicating such success, and the tools available at the local level to advance community-owned renewable energy and energy democracy. For more information on the specific strategies we discussed and more, check out ILSR's interactive Community Power Toolkit, as well as excellent toolkits from the NAACP and Meister Consultants. To better understand how state policy helps or hinders energy democracy in your community, see ILSR's Community Power Map. You can keep up with local energy democracy efforts across the country by subscribing to ILSR's Local Energy Rules podcast or our weekly energy newsletter at ILSR.org. Thanks again, and keep your energy local.